the Center for Critical Thinking and Moral Critique, in concert with Sonoma State University, is proud to present videotape proceedings of the International Conference on Critical Thinking and Educational Reform. Since this is second in a series, I'm going to very quickly telescope what the first in the series covered. And if you want more uh, of that, you will, you will need to consult that or some of my writings. Uh, but I think I can telescope it in a way that will not um, make unintelligible what follows. We need to begin with a shared concept of critical thinking here. And so let me tell you very briefly what that concept is as I understand it. And I'll put it in terms first of ordinary language, and then I'll translate it into a little more technical language, which will be part of the thread which I develop in the course of this session. Here is a very ordinary language statement of what critical thinking is. It's a process whereby the mind takes charge of itself by understanding how it thinks and what makes it think better. And it uses this knowledge and translates that knowledge into skill in self-improvement in thinking. Shorthand, critical thinking is thinking that assesses itself through knowledge of itself, knowledge of its deficiencies, and knowledge of its strengths. Alternative formulation, critical thinking is self-directed thinking disciplined by knowledge of the intellectual criteria and standards whereby you can assess your own thinking. Or, finally, in a kind of catchy way, critical thinking is thinking about your thinking while you're thinking in order to make your thinking better. And learning what's involved in doing that and then doing it is what critical thinking is about. So critical thinking by its very nature involves thinking interacting with thinking in a self-reflexive way. Everybody thinks it is of, hum it's of our nature to think and we think in sometimes insightful ways sometimes in narrow ways, sometimes clearly, sometimes unclearly, sometimes in a relevant way and sometimes in an irrelevant way, and so on. But our mind does not automatically pick out which is which. Because in addition to the innate capacity which we share to be reasoning creatures, we have more to our nature than that we're also egocentric creatures. And our egos play tricks upon us. They deceive us in certain very specific ways. The mind strongly gravitates toward beliefs which are comfortable, for example. Whereas truth has no necessary connection to what it is that is comfortable to believe. Truth, or rather our sense of what is true, gravitates toward the ideas we have heard most frequently expressed as true by people around us who are significant others to us, our parents, our teachers, our playmates, our peers and colleagues. The mind naturally gravitates toward the view that these ideas are true because people that we care about hold them. But there is no correlation in reality 
necessarily between people that we admire, like, and respect, and the truth of their ideas. And therefore, some very natural tendencies of the human mind need to be corrected by abilities to recognize possible pitfalls and try to intervene in our thinking with stra strategies which enable us to catch ourselves at our worst and improve our thinking. This, of course, is not being done with the, with the notion of feeling bad about ourselves or thinking, gee, why, why isn't our thinking better? Or why, um, why should I um, look at my thinking in a negative way? The point is simply that our thinking is our guide in life. As we think, so we act. See a situation one way, you act in a way corresponding to it. If somebody seems to you in your thinking to be your enemy, you treat them as your enemy. If somebody seems to be in your mind your friend, you treat them as your friend. But sometimes those who seem to be our friends are our enemies. And sometimes those who seem to be our enemies have no malicious intentions toward us. And therefore, once again, if we're going to get beyond the weaknesses of the human mind when it functions at the lower level, we have to develop the capacities for it to function at the higher levels. Unfortunately, the lower levels are instinctive. The higher levels require cultivation. And so you don't have to train somebody to believe what they want to believe. What they want to believe, they naturally gravitate toward. But to believe something that is a painful truth requires discipline, in which we resist some of these natural tendencies. So this is the concept, the general concept of critical thinking. And then the question becomes, well, what do you have to do to do that? What does this have to do with teaching kindergarten reading? or? taking the children on a vacation, or uh, going on a picnic, or uh, interrelating with your children, or teaching chemistry, or teaching physics, or teaching nursing, or teaching literature. What does it have to do with that? Well, it has this to do it, with it, that whenever students are learning, whenever we're learning, and we're behaving, we're using our minds, well or poorly. And it's in our interest to use them well, just as it is in our interest to keep our body in as fit a condition as we can. And in the same way, as you develop physical fitness, put a little energy into developing your body, it becomes easier and easier and you feel better. But initially, it doesn't feel so good and your body resists. So too does the mind. Now, what are some of the things which we have to learn in order to do what I'm talking about? I want to introduce a kind of technical concept here and translate critical thinking into it. I put on the overhead here three, three concepts. The logic of reasoning, the logic of the content and the logic of the student's thinking, or the logic of your thinking, if you want to learn. The logic of reasoning represents that part of our mind which needs to be developed if we are to function in a higher order rather than a lower order way. We have to be reasoners. And we have to develop our capacity to reason, because reason, which comes from the word ratio in Latin and goes back ultimately to an Indo-European Europe, European root, means to figure out. To figure out. To reason critically involves to figure out with standards, going back to the Greek word criterion, which means standard or test and the Greek word kritikos, which means to discern and judge. We develop our reasoning. In developing our reasoning, we're developing that part of our mind which constructs, analyzes, 
manipulates and assesses logic. And when I say logic, I don't mean what may happen or has happened in traditional formal or informal logic courses. I mean something much broader than that. I mean it in the sense in which the following expressions are intelligible. The logic of tennis, the logic of chess, the logic of numbers, the logic of modern physics, the logic of pathology, pathologic, biologic, biology, sociologic, sociology, psychologic, psycholo uh, anthropologic, anth anthropology, the logic of your personal relationships, the logic of your parenting, the logic of your subconscious mind, the logic of the news, the logic of the media, the logic of experience, all of those expressions are intelligible within the logic of the English language. That is, if you look up the word logic in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find that those meanings are quite consistent with the traditional use of the word. What is it that all of those uses capture? It captures what exists when there is a system of logical relationships that exist either between ideas or realities. That, now let me give you an example. What is it that biologists are trying to do? They're trying to construct a system of ideas which makes sense of the logic of living things. What does that assume? It assumes that living things have a logic. That is, they are not the way living things function and the interrelationships there are not anything you damn well pleased to make them. They're a specific kind of thing which can be discovered or not discovered. The logic of anatomy, physiology, is perfectly logical. Why? Because our anatomy and physiology is. That is, the fundamental assumption of all science and pursuit of knowledge is that reality is logical doesn't mean, of course, that it matches any particular logic we've constructed, because we may not yet have constructed the particular logic that this reality represents, but that it can be done. Not totally, not completely, not exclusively, maybe not even absolutely. And I'm not talking about metaphysics here. I'm talking about practically and actually. That is, in principle, you can understand your relationship to your husband or your wife. It isn't unintelligible. It may be tricky, it may be mysterious, it may be counterfeited, it may not be completely disclosed, it may be painful. But it's there, it can be understood. And when it's understood, it all makes sense in a system. This is the basic idea that drives the mind forward, that the natural relationship between the development of reason and the development of that which reason is reasoning about. And if somebody says, well, what if our minds are tailor-made to deceive us even when we reason, and that reality is constructed in some way that it will always remain unintelligible to us, well then, let's close up the universities and let's tear down the libraries and let's just have some fun. Uh, because all of that is uh, a deception. But we can proceed on that assumption. Science never proceeds on the assumption. No seeker of knowledge proceeds on the assumption that maybe we understand all we can understand. Maybe we've reached the end. Maybe this puzzle can't be solved. No, there always is that confidence, or at least that drive, to figure it out, to reason it through, and to make sense of it. Even when people come up with what might be called contradictory logics, they show why that makes sense. In other words, they make it logical. The human mind simply does not accept that anything in principle cannot be understood. Well, in any case, this is the concept 
And in the classroom, we have three logics we have to deal with. The first logic we have to deal with is the logic of reasoning itself. And what does that include? It includes nine features or dimensions. Whenever we're reasoning, each of these dimensions is present no matter whether it's microbes we're reasoning about, poems we're reasoning about, dancing, health, construction, architecture, bacteria, parasites. There are nine elements present in the reasoning mind. Purpose. You can't reason for no purpose. Some problem. And if you want to know the relationship between critical thinking and problem solving, there is no critical thinking without a problem. And to solve problems uncritically is not to solve them. So you have a purpose, you, have, you must have a problem, you must have information. You can't reason with nothing. Out of nothing comes nothing. No information, nothing else. Then you need to conceptualize that information. You need to interpret it. No way around that. And when you interpret it, you come to conclusions on the basis of assumptions. And therefore, you can't reason without making assumptions. And you can't reason without making inferences or coming to conclusions. And the conclusions you come to have implications and consequences, which need to be followed out in order to determine whether it fits in with the implications and consequences of what we already know to be so. And when you do this, you always do it within a point of view. And so I can always ask you in your reasoning, what's the purpose? What's the problem? Where are you getting your information? What conclusions are you coming to? Let's look at the implications of those conclusions. What are you taking for granted? What reasons can you give me in support of your conclusions? And within what point of view are you reasoning? For example, sometimes you're reasoning within the point of view of physics, sometimes within the point of view of biology, sometimes legally, sometimes morally, sometimes economically. And if you're reasoning psychologically, sometimes you're re reasoning in a Freudian way, or a Jungian way, or an Adlerian way, or sometimes you're reasoning like your mother does, or your father does. Or sometimes you're reasoning like an American does, or a Canadian, and so forth and so on. If you're reasoning within a point of view, and so forth. So these are the features of reasoning, the dimensions of reasoning, and these are things that all good reasoners become comfortable checking. And one of the problems with the classroom is that this is not the vocabulary that students are learning. And they're not good at identifying these features of their reasoning. And therefore, they're not good at taking their reasoning apart. And you can't advance one iota if you can't take your reasoning apart. The only way you can do it is somehow intuitively, and that has significant problems. Secondly, we need the logic of the content. Re to reason biologically is not the same thing as to reason historically, which is not the same thing as to reason legally, which is not the same thing as to reason economically, which is not the same thing as to reason with arithmetically. So we need to know the logic of the thing that we're, the domain that we're reasoning in. And then finally, if the students are to integrate the logic of the subject into their own thinking, then their own thinking must be engaged. And we need to understand the logic of their thinking because we know from empirical research that the mind cannot absorb what it cannot think through on its own terms. So whatever, this is a basic principle of learning, whatever you learn, you learn on the basis of what you already know. And if you knew absolutely nothing, you could learn absolutely nothing. You need something to learn something. And Piaget, of course, has studied at great, in great detail how at each transitional stage children are using what they already learned to try to figure out, as best they can, this new thing. And first they try to assimilate, and then at higher levels they start to accommodate. That is, when they assimilate, they just treat the thing like the old thing. No adaptation. And then they start to adapt and make their thinking fit this thing rather than to make this thing fit their thinking. 
And of course, that's a good model for seeing somebody who, as an adult, functions at a lower level. They make reality fit their thinking. They don't make their thinking fit reality. They will twist reality to, make sh to protect their thinking. They won't abandon their thinking in the face of reality that refutes it. And we recognize this to be the closed-minded person. In any case, we need to foster the logic of the student's thinking, and we need to engage it. And what we're concerned with here in this session is what this has to do with listening and reading. There are four basic modalities of learning that we utilize in school. Reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Well, reading and listening have a similar logic. So does speaking and writing. Do you see the similarity? Reading and listening. In both of those cases, let's take a look at this for a moment. Let's take listening. We have a speaker and we have a listener. Each of them is facing a particular problem. The speaker the speaker is facing something like this problem. How can I put the logic of my experience into words? How can I use the logic of language to construct a logic that matches the logic of how I experience things? And this, of course, sheds light on the logical complexity of communication, or the attempt to communicate. We think, we treat speaking as if its logic was very simple. You just said whatever came to your mind, and people listened, and then they understand. But we all know, when we think about it a little more, it's not that simple, because when you're going to speak, you have to consider your audience, and you have to consider your experience, what it is you want to say, and then you have to find the words whose logic expresses that. In fact, you have to do that even when you speak to yourself. And when you listen to how you speak to yourself. In accounting for your very experience. Let's suppose you're feeling disturbed. You have to name that disturbance. You have to take that disturbance. I've already got it into the logic of something, don't I? The logic of disturbance. Do you see? So I've already translated it a, a bit. But what kind of disturbance? Is it the disturbance of fear, irritation, anger, envy, hate? Which disturbance is it? Your mind does not automatically select the right word. But the word it selects will structure your sense of what is going on. So you have to try to translate what is going on into a word or use words that capture the logic of what is really going on. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why achieving command of the language you speak is absolutely essential. No one can think well who cannot use at least one language well. And every word in the language has a unique logic. There are no perfect synonyms. There are approximations, but they're not perfect. And one must be sensitive to their nuances because of the implications that will necessarily be present. Think of this. What is the difference between these two questions? What is your weight? What is your tonnage? They're both in the area of weight, but you immediately see that the one has very different implications. What is the difference, phenomenologically, between someone 
who is trying to jam their ideas down your throat, and someone who is trying to persuade you and has the courage of their convictions. These, are very diff these words have a very different logic, and it requires sensitivity to what's going on and picking the word that really matches the logic of the situation. What's the difference between being clever and being cunning? There's a, very, there's a similarity and an overlap between the logic of those two words. They're not the same word. What is the difference between a country in which there is voting and a country that is democratic? Can you say that if a country holds elections that it follows that they are democratic? And we can see, no, the logic is different. The logic of voting is consistent with the logic of democracy, but it does not necessarily imply it. Now we ask a further question, could you have a democratic culture that didn't have any voting whatsoever? And now it puzzles our mind to begin to think, well, what do we have to ask? Well, what's the basic logic of democracy? So now let's look into that for a moment. What is the basic logic of democracy? Etymologically, it is, first part, the people, second part, rule. Okay, here's then the question. Can the people rule without voting? Well, let's see, could you have a democratic relationship amongst friends? Could you relate as equals and make decisions democratically without voting? Well, as you begin to think about it, how often have you voted with your friends? I mean, how often have you made decisions by holding votes? Sometimes it's by consensus when no one actually does vote but where you persuade each other. Now we can ask, what's the relationship then between rational persuasion and democracy? Suppose I can manipulate you into voting the way I want you to vote, and you're happy with that. Is that democracy? Well, I continue to think, what, I'm do what am I doing? I'm exploring the logic of words, and therefore exploring the logic of the realities they represent. And I'm trying to get clear and precise and be accurate about what these words entail and what the relationships are between them. And it's this kind of very careful, nuanced thinking that students need to be respectful of and learn to develop. And yet, of course, the downside is we live in society, in societies in which words are thrown around fast and loose with no respect for their implications, or rather for using their implications for purposes of propaganda and manipulation. And so our children do not experience many people who are careful and judicious and responsible in the use of the words that they use. And so this is a problem that we face. But the main point is, if I'm going to speak well, I have to raise this question, how can I put the logic of my experience into words? And that's a problem for the speaker. What is the problem for the listener? For the listener, see, I didn't have that completely there, did I? There it is. That's enough. Don't want you to get too smart. For the listener, how can I translate the logic of her words into the logic of my experience? So you tell me words, I have to translate those words into something that is concrete meaning that can be true or false, right or wrong, intelligible or unintelligible. Now, most people do not respect the difficulty of doing this. To understand another is a terribly difficult thing to do. It's very easy to delude ourselves, and here is the way we can do it. We simply say, if I would have said those words and meant this by it, then that's what you mean. And if I would have said this other thing and meant that by it, that's what you mean when you say it. But that doesn't make sense. We can't assume that people will select exactly the same words to say 
what they're trying to say, as we would have selected had we been them. In fact, we can be pretty sure that's not true. We can be pretty sure that they're going to select words that are somewhat different from the words we would have selected. Because even if they're describing the same thing, they're going to describe it in a somewhat different way because they have a different viewpoint. And so they're going to see it a little bit differently. And so in order to hear and understand what somebody else is saying, I have to construct the logic of their thinking in my thinking. I have to try to think like them for a moment while I'm listening. I've got to try to get into their point of view empathically and see things as they see them. Then I have to step outside and compare it with my best sense of what is so, question and discuss. It's an act of creation. Listening is a creative act. Because as a listener, you create a system of meanings. You cannot do other than that. And you're trying to create a system of meanings that matches the system of meanings which the person intends to express. Of course, they are also creating. They are creating a system of meanings which they're trying to use to make sense of their own experience. And so we're both involved in creative thinking. We're producing a system. And we're trying to get these systems to interface with each other. Now, if the listener is a critical listener, then the critical listener knows that that system of meanings that is being expressed to me has a logic, and I can pursue it. And therefore, I can always say, well, why are you telling me this? What's your purpose? Uh, and if they're trying to persuade me of something, I can say, well, what's, what's the problem as you see it? Or I could say, here is what I'm hearing you say is the problem. Do I have you right? Have I, have I captured your meaning? Let me put it into my language. I would have put the question this way. Do you accept that as an appropriate translation of the problem as you see it? Or have I missed something here? OK, if that's the problem, and I understand this is what you see as your response to that, where in your experience are you getting information that bears upon this? Or are you getting it someplace else? I can tell you about my experience and how my experience would seem to weigh upon this, but maybe you've had experiences I haven't. So could you give me some examples from your experience? Now you're exploring the dimension of information, where that information is coming to. And then they describe their experience. Aha, uh -huh, I see. I think I see. But then how did you get from that experience to that conclusion? Couldn't you have come to this other conclusion as well? Why this one, not that one? Now you're exploring the relationship between the information and the interpretation. Many years ago, I went to a party. And after the party, my then girlfriend was angry at me. And we talked a little bit. And it turned out she perceived me as flirting. And she gave me the facts. Fact, 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 fact. Who I was sitting next to, how long I was sitting next to the person, the animated nature of my discussion, the fact that I didn't speak much to her. And she laid out all the facts. Therefore, you were flirting. And I said, excellent observations, very accurate, but therefore I was being friendly. So same facts, different interpretation. From a different point of view, the same thing can look differently. Now, is this insignificant? No, it's not significant. Because in her point of view, and now I give you what might be taken to be her possible reasoning, should I stay in a relationship with a man that I can't trust, who doesn't own up to the fact that he flirts, and therefore is dishonest? Now I'll step outside of that and reason within my point of view. Should I stay in a relationship with a woman who is paranoid and who cannot be comfortable when I speak in a friendly way to other women? Must I? abjure all discussion with other women because I'm in this relationship now? Two different lines of reasoning, and they all hinge on an interpretation. They hinge on an interpretation. And that interpretation hinges upon other assumptions that we're making. That is, there is reasoning going on here. And as a reasoner, I try to figure it out. 
Or we could just say, hey, let's kiss and make up. But what happens then? It comes back later. It never goes away. And then the phenomenon of the broken record. Let's run over that argument again. You'll say this, and I'll say that, and then you'll reply with this example, and then I'll say this to hurt your feelings, then you'll say that to hurt my feelings. Now, I've said it all, so could we just forget it and not do it? Or do you really want to run through it again for the 1,000th time? So then, and what can be more boring than to go through these scripted exchanges in which non-communication is taking place? Here my point is to reason well, to figure this out, to sort it out, to make sense of it, and have done with it once and for all is so much better. And so reasoning, reasoning well, even reasoning in great detail about things which may seem to be I I insignificant, may save a lot of time, a lot of pain, and a lot of suffering. Uh, all right, so we have a logical problem in communication. The speaker has to take the logic of their experience as they understand it, translate it using the logic of words into something that's intelligible to the listener. The listener has to take the logic of her experience, hear those words, try to translate those words into the logic of her own experience. This is difficult. Therefore, we should realize that disagreement is an accomplishment. Because disagreement presupposes understanding. Do You see, it's logically unintelligible to say, I don't know what you mean, but I disagree with it. <laughs> if you say you disagree, you say, I understand you. And to say, I understand you, is to claim a lot. It's very difficult to achieve understanding. Now let me tell you how this interfaces with teaching students how to think. Students read an editorial or they read something, and very often they're quick to agree or disagree. They don't check to see whether they understand. It's as if it doesn't matter whether they understand. I have a right to disagree if I want. Only if you understand do you have a right to disagree. Politically, you have a right to be disagreeable or to express disagreements anytime you want, or virtually anytime you want, but intellectually and morally, you don't have a right to disagree with somebody you don't understand. It doesn't make sense, and it betrays a lack of integrity if you really know what's going on here. But the students don't see that. They don't see that, so there's a lot that students need to learn in order to begin to grasp this. Well, how can we do, how can we begin to help them to become good readers and therefore translate the logic of the text into the logic of their thinking? Good listeners, translate the logic of what somebody else is saying into the logic of their experience. How can we get them to do this? Not unless they see this as complex. As long as they see this in their own intuitive mind, it's perfectly simple. Nothing could be easier than to read and understand, to hear and disagree, to hear and agree. We've got to free them from, from that delusion first. How can we do this? Very In very specific ways. For example, Jack says something in class, and then I say, Jill, what do you understand, Jack? to have just said. Would you put what Jack said in your own words? Now Jill may say, gee, I guess I wasn't listening that closely. In which case we go back to Jack and we say, Jack, would you repeat that again? Uh, Jill wasn't completely listening. Perhaps some of the rest of you weren't either. So let's listen to Jack again closely. Okay, Jack says, okay, Jill, are you ready? Yes. And then Jill expresses what she heard Jack is saying. Jack, is that accurate? Do you accept that translation of what you were saying? Yes, okay, then give us an example, because I'm still not perfectly clear. Give me an example from your experience. Ah, then would you accept this example of it, and I give an example? No, I wouldn't. Well, then I'm confused again, because I would have thought you would. You model the complexities in understanding. You take a paragraph. Let the students read it. Did you understand it? Yes, close your books. 
write a summary in your own words that has the following features. Say everything that it said, but no more than what it said. Give exactly the emphasis that the paragraph gave to it. Add no points, but include all the points that were said in it. And express it in your own words, maintaining the emphasis of the original. How many of the students will do that reasonably well? Zero. Because it takes discipline. You have to be a careful reader. They've never practiced that. They don't know how to read closely. So you go back and say, OK, let's try it sentence by sentence. Here's a sentence. Did you all see the sentence? Think about it. Take a little time to think about it. OK, now I erase that sentence. I don't want you to write that sentence. I know you can remember for five seconds the sentence. I want you to write what that sentence means in your own words. They all write it. OK, what did you write? We hear this. What did you write? What did you write? What did you write? And we get four different sentences. Do those four things mean the same thing? Clearly, they don't. Well, is there an ambiguity then in the original statement? Or did somebody misread it? And you talk about it. Of course, you have to slow down to do this. You can't always be doing speed reading if you're doing this. But in reading and in thinking, slow is fast. That is, do a good job of what you are doing. And when you do, you sort some basic things out and then you can step on the accelerator. For example, if I take the pains to understand the logic of your basic belief system, I try, I work with you, I try to understand you, I try to understand your fundamental ideas, I put the time and energy into doing that, I could pretty well safely predict a lot of the other things you believe if I understand those basic things. But if I don't understand your basic beliefs, you'll continually be surprising me because I don't see what's at the basis of it all. And in human thinking, there are some powerful, deep ideas that organize other ideas very predictably. Let's take, for example, Christian science. This is a system of thinking and a system of believing. And there's one basic idea that underlies, as far as I can see, the totality of Christian science, so that if you accept this idea, you're a Christian scientist. And all of Christian science comes out of it. And here's the idea. God is good, and God is all. God is good, and God is all. Then what's evil? An illusion. Do you see? A mistaken thinking. Because if God is good and God is all, then there ain't no evil. Therefore, all the things that appear to be evil must somehow be an illusion. And therefore, we need to read and think to correct uh, these illusions we're experiencing, such as pain and suffering and death and these other sorts of things. So now we're going to have reading rooms in order to get us to read and work out our thinking so that we can see the reality of God is good and God is all. Or let's take another very different system. Whose system of thinking comes down to this basic idea? The fundamental motivation of all human persons is sexual. Freud, do you see? And if you understand the full implications of that, then you can see a lot of the logic of Freud's writings, which is volume after volume after volume over many years. But fundamental logic that underlies it. And so go to the essential logic, keep probing for that, and then test. Do I have it? Does it make sense? OK, if you believe that, then let me see. Let me take a shot. Then you also believe this. Is that right? Yes. OK, good. Interesting. Let's try this over here. Then you probably believe this about parenting, do you? Yes. Ah, uh-huh. I think I'm getting it. Or no, I don't. Oh, OK, back to square one. I wonder why. Why don't you believe it? Is that incon an inconsistency? So it's the sense that you can figure out some basic ideas well, and then lots of other things fall into place. And I've learned this again and again. I mean, w once you get into this, you rediscover it over and over again. And I, I discovered it early on because of the help of a math teacher I had who 
forced us to learn how to derive the equations that we were using in the math class. Because, she said, there's no point in using an equation that you don't understand. And if you don't understand the ideas out of which it comes, then you don't understand it, so there's no point in using it. Well, for the first time, I learned to think mathematically. I began to get underneath the formulas to ideas that were very basic. I began to reason like a mathematician or a would-be mathematician, and math became easier as a result. Now, that took a little time. We didn't cover as much territory, but then in my subsequent classes, for the first time, I started to get A's rather than C's because we sacrificed speed coverage, half understanding, for fundamental understanding of some deep ideas. And here it reminds me of a favorite couplet of mine from Alexander Pope. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not of that Perean stream. There shallow drafts intoxicate the brain, but drinking deeply sobers you again. And unfortunately, students aren't drinking very deeply. And classes are structured so we move very swiftly. Discussions occur in a lot of classes. Somebody says something, it isn't analyzed. Somebody says something, somebody says something. People aren't listening to each other. There is no discipline here. Here is a teaching strategy. What is worth saying is worth saying clearly. And if you say something, we're all going to listen. And we're going to all understand it to the best of our abilities. That means all of us have to work at it. And so if you say something and nobody says, I need a clarification of that, then I can call on this other person and say, OK, explain it. If you can't explain it, then you should have raised your hand and said, I don't understand that. Uh, so what do we do then? We create occasions. Whenever we talk, then students are listening. And we bring them into the process of critical listening by challenging them with questions that force them to decide whether they are listening adequately or not. Reformulation, elaboration, exemplification. Three techniques. If you understand, you can reformulate it in your own words. If you understand it, you can elaborate on it. And if you understand it, you can give an example of it. So if I say it, you say you understand it, then you reformulate it, you elaborate on it, you give an example. If you can't, then here's your move. Could you elaborate on that? Could you reformulate that? Put it another way. Could you give me an example? And so you, as a student in my class, you either make the moves or I make the moves. So you can always make the move, could I have more elaboration? Or could you reformulate that? Or could I have an example? Or then I will make the moves. And so as I'm talking, then I've got to check with the class to see if they're with me or not with me in this respect. Now what about reading? What about reading? Here's the way I suggest, the basic way that we need to teach reading. And it needs to be done at this present time in all classes, or virtually all classes, where the students are expected to read anything. And after a while, if enough of us do it, we can stop doing it, because we can just presuppose that students are able to do it. But we're not there yet. And that is, you take the thing you want them to read, and you say, let me model it for you. Let me read a couple of sentences aloud. And as I read them aloud, I'm going to interact with those sentences. I'm going to, I'm going to dialogue with the author. I'm going to say things like this. Well, let's see. What is the purpose of this thing that I'm reading? I think it's this. Let me read on. Do I understand what the person is saying? Could I reformulate that? Let me try it. I would reformulate it this way. So let me read on and see if I'm right. Oh, I see. What the, what the author is now saying does seem to make sense of what I said before. If that's true, then the basic problem is this. Let me read on and see if that's the case. And so forth. I illustrate that process. Then I say, Judy, would you take over? You take the next paragraph, read it aloud to the class, and express your questions, dialogue with the text as best you can. You don't worry about saying everything. It's not expected. 
to say whatever you'd have to say. So Judy does, and then I take the same passage that Judy read, and I go and I dialogue with it a little bit, and then they notice, oh, Judy could have done this, could have done that, could, could have done the other. Okay, fine, I do that a couple of times, and I say, groups, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Everyone is A, or a B, or a C. Then I say, A, you take the next paragraph, read it aloud to B and C, and dialogue with the text as you read. B and C, after A is finished, you explain what you would have asked, what you would have said, how you would have dialogued, so that A can hear from B and C how B and C responded, and B and C can hear how A responded. They do that. Now, I read that same passage aloud and dialogue with it. And now A and B and C hear how I'm dialoguing with it. And they see the moves that I'm making, some of which perhaps they already made, some of which they didn't make. Then I say, OK, B, take over. Read the next paragraph aloud. A and C, listen. Then A and C respond, and you get the logic, right? And you keep this logic going until you're satisfied with the quality of the reading. And then you say, when I say read pages, that's what I mean. I don't mean you let your eyes go over it and wait for meaning to happen. It means you extract the meaning, you construct the meaning, you produce the meaning through intellectual work. Your mind works on the text. It takes it apart. It tests it. It hypothesizes. It predicts. It tries to take the text and bring it into the very uh, marrow of its intellectual bone. Very difficult process, very labor intensive. So we're not going to be doing speed reading in here. Evelyn Wood, you may leave. We're going to do close reading in here. And what's worth reading is worth reading well. So we're going to get that, we're going to get that down pat. Now, of course, there is the question of how do you test to make sure that your students are reading that way, right? So I have a couple of techniques to mention. One is, if you can require the students to mark their texts, then you require them to mark their texts using notations, which they are prepared to explain. And then, uh, if you do that, uh, you may give this following option. Those of you who don't want to mark up your text, you are required to keep reading notes. And here's the way I want you to do it. Your notes for a given page put on the left-hand side the number of the page, and then when you go to the next page, just draw a line across the page. So you don't, you know, you could have a page of notes maybe in just a, a certain portion of your page. And then if, I, if, we're, if we come into class, then I might say, okay, you had the first chapter to read that was 1 through 45. Everyone open your textbook to page 35 or to your reading notes on 35. And I walk along and I say, you didn't read it you didn't read it, you didn't read it, you didn't read it. All of these people I'm pointing to leave because you're going to go to the library and you're going to read what was assigned for today because you don't qualify to work on what we're working on because we're going to presuppose that you've read that. So you're not ready to work with us on this until you read it, so go to the library, read it, then you come back and we go ahead and work in class. And that's one technique which I use. And of course, whatever technique you use, whatever procedures you use, there will be ways in which that procedure can come aground or not work. And as a critical thinker, you simply take that as another challenge, something else to figure out, another new problem. You don't expect that any technique is problem free. In fact, you expect that where you're dealing with humans, you'll have nothing but problems. But you're ready to come up with another technique, another solution. Uh, and so we all of us face this challenge of taking speaking and listening seriously. We all do a lot of speaking as teachers or professors. And as students, or our students, they do a tremendous amount of listening. Unfortunately, a lot of speaking is undisciplined speaking, which does not display its own logic well. And, and very much listening is highly impressionistic, and no intelligible logic is constructed by it. 
And the end result, of course, is a lack of intellectual discipline and a minimum of true, communica com true communication and a minimum of education. Thank you very much.